Rachel Madel from Talking With Tech. And I'm Chris Bouguet from Talking With Tech. We have a podcast dedicated to augmentative and alternative communication, all things related to helping kids with complex communication needs. If you have a passion for helping people with language disabilities, this is the show for you. Each episode features an interview or a roundtable discussion on a topic related to augmentative communication and helping people with language disabilities. And we're really passionate about giving practical strategies to clinicians working in the field who are working with children or adults, anything related to AAC. So you can look us up on iTunes or you can find us on Facebook. We've got a group over there or check out our website at bit.ly slash TWT podcast. Please join our community of professionals that are working to ensure that everyone can say whatever they want to say, however they want to say it. Please listen carefully. What is communication? An essential behavior of life. We have the both blessing and responsibility of trying to foster another. It's the strongest way for two people to convey information to each other. Communication is a lifeline. It's just connection with other people. Connecting people in terms of ideas, or thoughts, or needs. Draws us out of ourselves, draws us into that relationship, you know, builds up our families. Without it, we'd be lost. Whatever it is that we do to express intent and achieve an impact. Communication is the ability to express your needs, wants, frustrations and desires to anyone that you feel needs to have that information. Welcome to Speech Science Episode 94. Proud members of the Exceptional Podcast Network. I'm Matt Hot, joined by the mouth in the East, Michael McLeod. What's up, buddy? Hey, man. And we are michelle tonight as Michelle Wintering is traveling uh, over the weekend with her baby. I see you have a nice little uh, baseball in your hand there. I do. I picked it up, and I always have a fidget in my hand, usually a spinner, an action figure, a piece of Lego. Uh, today is a baseball that my son got uh, last year as a foul ball, and or I guess not a foul ball, but like a ball thrown in. So it's my From fidget for today. Yeah, we sat real close. We got lucky, had some good seats, and the baseball coach from the Braves tossed it to him. So Is that a Cincinnati Reds? Yes, so it was at the Reds game, but the Braves uh, coach tossed it to us. So The Reds have been bad for a long time, huh? I know, I'm not a... Ugh. We're not oh. here to talk Reds, though. We are here <laughs> to talk speech therapy. We want you to talk to us. Head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com, and from there, you can find all of our back episodes, or you can email us, speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com, or give us a phone call or text, 614-681-1798, or find us on Patreon, patreon.com slash speech science podcast. Mike, you have had a wonderful week, I hope. What's been going on with you, my friend? I have. It, it's definitely been a, a fun, exciting week. Um, definitely have been doing a lot more uh, collaboration with other SLPs and uh, a little bit of supervision here and there. Uh, but overall, I've been I've been working with some great uh, professionals, other SLPs, school SLPs who I love to collaborate with, uh, as well as a lot of other uh, individuals who work within the schools. So I've been doing a lot of school visits recently for a lot of my private clients, uh, and that gives me a chance to collaborate with school professionals and school SLPs and uh, some school psychologists or counselors, whatever it may be. Uh, but being able to speak to to the other professionals that work with my students, that goes such a long way um, in terms of my work with my kids. So, so yeah, that's that is definitely one of my uh, one of my preferred things to do dur during the week is is uh, work with other professionals. When you go into a school district to work with the school based SLP, what is some of the hurdles that you have as like a, I don't want to call you an outside, but like a private practice SLP. Like, are there any big hurdles that you have to come across? Well, usually that comes from a lot of like the like the leadership okay. uh, around here. Due process is a huge thing, and 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 that sort of thing. Uh, going into mediation and due process, and and uh, and a lot of parents with students with IEPs tend to have advocates. So parent, so a lot of schools like to be very weary of outside professionals coming in, and certain schools, you know they'll have someone follow me around. Oh, and, really? Yeah. Yeah. And this is, it, it's rare. It depends on the situations. Uh, but sometimes I'll have someone follow me and take notes on my questions and, and other oh. schools are more lax. So public schools tend to have that, that person, uh, to follow me around and take notes or, or those sorts of things. Uh, the private schools are, are a bit more lax. Uh, but, 
um, pretty much an, another hurdle is really uh, just letting them know that that I'm there to collaborate and and you know within I I like to think at least it's me really learning from them. Uh, if anything, they're, they're the ones who are tied to the IEP uh, and are taking far more concrete data and are doing things beyond what I'm doing within in the clinic. Uh, so for me to be able to talk to them and learn what they're doing and uh, take a look at some of their data and look at how the IEP has progressed over the over the years and months that is really beneficial to me. So, so without these school SLPs, uh, with many of my kids, uh, I, I, I don't want to say I'd be lost, but uh, I don't think I'd be able to get the progress that I'm seeing without, uh, the work that I get from them. Oh, that makes sense, man. Yeah. Um, for me, I've had a pretty easy week. We had to do all of our progress reports and I don't know about any other SLP out there, but I think that for me, progress report time is an interesting time because then I start to realize maybe I need to rearrange some of my groups uh -huh. because I'm starting to look at data trends and I'm like, Oh, this kid's not getting as many opportunities. And I'm looking at other people in his group who have more opportunities. And then I'm seeing other groups that the student may fit into. So I hope I'm not yep. the only SLP out there that looks at progress report time and go, Oh my gosh, I need to rearrange all my groups. I highly doubt you're the only <laughs> one. Highly doubt that. But yeah, so no, Monday I had a whole day off just to do progress reports. And then this weekend, uh, today actually my son's three-year-old birthday party was today. So I got nice. to watch him have way more exciting moments than I have had in a long time. And I got to watch him introduce his birthday dance, which looks like a three-year-old version of the floss, if you know the dance I'm talking about. Of course. With more butt shaking and him just saying my birthday dance it's my birthday dance my birthday dance and i heard that for six hours today so yeah i am sick and <laughs> I, I am sick and tired of the of the floss i'm sick and tired of Fortnite. all of those things i'm just i'm, I'm ready for those things to uh to, to go away forever I, you might be an old man dude those are never going away i they apologize are definite, they are definitely going away every <laughs> everything every, everything has a has a phase Remember Pokemon Go? How how big that was. I still for a couple play of months? Pokemon Go. Uh, well, I think the amount of people playing it yeah, have greatly that is have true. greatly decreased. So it's only a matter of time. On today's episode, we're going to tell you what are the games and the toys you need to have in your speech and therapy or speech and language therapy sessions. Also, we're going to look at a study about the effect of vocabulary intervention on text comprehension. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Virginia Autism Institute Bridge Program for students with autism. But first, let's start off with this. Low initiation of joint attention at 10 months may be linked to ASD diagnosis or an autism spectrum diagnosis uh, at 36 months. Mike, joint attention is just the ability to look at the same object and play with the same toy, correct? Uh, yeah, it really goes way beyond that. Really, uh, this is something that I, I think all parents look out for, uh, whether they really even have that training or not. I think this is something that that is just so innate to to human interaction. I think this is something that uh, a lot of parents will look out for, and I'm, I'm sure pediatricians will always uh, take note of it during checkups. But this joint attention is just so crucial uh, in in overall communication and life skills and and really everything. Um, I've worked with a few uh, elementary school age students with autism that really just don't have that joint attention. And it makes the therapy so hard. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember working with one, uh, one elementary aged uh, student who had some language. Uh, I think it was just a lot of rote memorization and kind of just repeating but he would run into the clinic and he would run immediately for a couple of very specific toys. Uh, and he would just play with those toys and he would just play with them very inappropriately and in various ways. Uh, but in terms of allowing other people into his play and joining his play, that's when you would see the behaviors and the yelling and the screaming and sometimes even the self harm. Oh, but really? That's, but that's really that, that this joint attention is so crucial to language and, but joint attention is the number one thing that parents can look out for. And us as speech pathologists can really educate these parents and continue to stress the importance of this joint attention because without it, uh, you're really just not going to get that, that overall back and forth communication that, that, that is necessary for life. So 
I always thought joint attention was just the ability to both look at the same thing or play with the same thing. But when they talk about initiating, is that where it's child or adolescent led where they say, here's what we're doing versus therapist or parent driven? Yeah, um, I, I, I think joint initiation is one thing. Uh, it's really just the initiation of that joint attention. Okay. Uh, uh, joint initiation and joint attention, I really look at them hand in hand as the same thing, whether they're initiating it or maintaining it. I don't think they necessarily have to initiate that joint attention, but as long as they're able to get into it. Got it. Like get into it and maintain it for a specific period of time, have that eye contact, have that smile, play with a toy for the same time, uh, look and point to something, uh, really go to another individual with communicative intent. Mm -hmm. That's really what joint attention is. Uh, you see it in infancy before there are there is that period of language acquisition. So for them to be able to initiate this joint attention and maintain it for the appropriate period of time, that's really what's crucial. Uh, I'm looking back at the article and it said, uh, so the researchers for this, well, this is coming out of biologicalpsychiatryjournal.com. That's where the Asha Leader article pulled the, the study. Um, and this was from uh, five people that have a lot of accents that I can't even attempt to pronounce. But basically, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they said that at 10 months of age, the rates of initiation were lower in infants later diagnosed with ASD than in comparison groups and followed an atypical development tra developmental trajectory from 10 months to 18 months. Uh, the live eye tracking study suggests that during an important period for the development of social cognition, 10 to 18 months, infants later diagnosed with ASD show marked atypicalities in initiation, but not reciprocal. Uh, the results indicate that initiation jo initiated joint attention is an important target for future uh, pro prodromal intervention trials. I don't know what prodromal means. Uh, that, trying to find where it says that. Did you go to the original like study? I did not. Oh, that's where that is. Prodromal, relating to or, de or denoting the period between the appearance of initial symptoms and the full development uh, later on. So, okay, that makes sense. Okay, there you go. Yeah, no, I, I I clicked the link to the journal of psychiatric neuroscience and therapeutics. We'll we, uh, we'll post that in the the study link. But I think this is important because a lot of times parents don't know to look for this initiation of joint attention, so that when you know autism symptoms, uh, you know I don't want to call them symptoms, but autism signs show up later and later at two three years old. That's where that idea that the vaccines. You know, this helps oh, fight yeah. that fake news, if you want to call it. Oh, yeah. And and this is something we're talking about early infancy. We're mm -hmm. talking about 10, 10 months here. So th this is something that where if we're seeing a delay in joint initiation, joint attention, you're really able to uh, take the initiative there and get this child evaluated and enrolled in some very, very early, early intervention. I'm talking like birth to three services before they hit that that typical stage of, of services between three to five. Uh, but if you're able to get some birth to three services here because you see yep. a lack of uh, – that that could really go a long way in improvement over the lifespan because this is really, uh, this is really something uh, that parents need to look out for. Uh, and, and without joint attention, you're simply – you're just – you're not going to see language without joint attention, meaningful language. If I'm reading the article right, which I may not be reading it right at all, uh, there were 28 students or children put into the high risk category and 22 of the 28 uh, later developed uh, autism or were later diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Yeah, there so. you go. That's real. That, that is really what it is. Uh, it really, if you really think about it at its core, it's really that attentional issue. Yep. There are many ADD, ADHD symptoms within autism, uh, and there's that social ish, social pragmatic issue within autism, uh, joint initiation issue, uh, and and this is really where you're seeing it. This is this is the early early stages of language acquisition, and this is a major roadblock towards acquiring more complex skills. We want to hear from you though. What is your thoughts? How have you noticed this, or how does this study change the way you practice? Head over to our website 
speechsciencepodcast.com. Email us speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com or give us a phone call 614-681-1798. Or if you want to hang out with Michael on the social medias, that's hashtag SSPod, right? Yes, sir. How Speaking. is our Instagram account, by the way? Uh, I just got a new phone, so I'm gonna have to relog. Ah. I'm gonna have to relog into it. Uh, but yeah, I think we're doing pretty well. We got, we have a lot of followers. We, let me check right. Let me check right now. We do. Speech we. Uh, I was gonna say, what is it? Speech underscore science. We got 1,300 followers. Nice. A lot of uh, a lot of people interacting with us. Uh, I see a lot on Facebook. Uh, I, I always see people posting like. Hey, I know this gets asked all the time, but what's everyone's favorite uh, speech therapy podcast? And, every, <laughs> and, and and I always see at least one person shouting out speech science. I love it. I and love that those. Is, those and that is one of that's one of the best because just doing this weekly and like just seeing these same faces of Matt and Michelle, Michelle and Matt, and knowing <laughs> knowing that people are out there listening to us, like wow, that, that's it's a good feeling. I have often thought about opening up a Discord for ourselves. Okay. Are, are you familiar with Discord? I am. Like, I'm wondering if we would have enough uh, want for a speech science podcast Discord. We could do it. I think Let's so. Do it. Yeah. Maybe we'll do that. Let us know. Email us speechscience at gmail.com. Let us know if you like that are that like that idea hey this next story is coming out of nbc 29 uh nbc 29.com virginia's autism institute's bridge program prepares students with autism for public school and i love this basically what they're doing is they link up students with autism uh with same age peers uh and they help the same age peer or the same age peers helps the students kind of get used to some of that social language skills and allows them to move into the regular school setting uh, a little bit easier. I love this kind of stuff. This is fantastic. This is this is something that really uh, we've spoken a, a good deal about uh, different uh, programs like this that are opening up, but this is absolutely fantastic. Uh, the fact that number one, that there is the funding to make this happen, that there were people with free time to make this happen, but this is absolutely crucial. And the fact that it's happening is beautiful and from from what i'm reading it sounds like a very successful program well and and yeah from what this is their inaugural program but there are programs like this across the country and i think what's super important to know about this is that i always tell my my families during iep meetings that and i learned this at a ohio speech and language hearing association conference was that for for those of us with the typical mindset it takes five to seven unique opportunities to really learn a skill and generalize it. So if mm -hmm. you're going to a new class by day seven or eight or five to eight, seven, you're feeling pretty good about that class. But with students with disabilities or deficits, it can take 50 to 140 opportunities to generalize that skill. And if you've got a kid that is um, academically very strong, but socially very needs a lot of help you're going to need those 50 to 100 times to really get that student to feel comfortable in the classroom to need the sensory input to succeed on that history exam absolutely and if they're working in, in an environment like this uh that seems to be very uh with very skilled workers and uh there's the there's the peer involvement uh this is more and Pretty much you're talking about getting these reps. You're talking about mm -hmm. getting these experiences, but getting them with peers in the, within the natural environment such as this from what I'm seeing in the pictures, th th there's a major difference between working on it one-on-one uh, -on -one with the speech therapist in the speech room, but getting it face-to-face, uh, you know, -face, uh, hand-to-hand with peers in a natural environment, really nothing can replace that. Bingo. Uh, so, this is like working with uh, with adult patients out in the community and, and, and doing things like that. And the school pretty much is a child's community. So working uh, working in the classroom, in an environment like this, on these skills, this is beautifully done. I love it. I mean, do you, have you ever worked with students getting them ready for school? Specifically the social part of getting ready for school? Say that one more time. Have you worked with students specifically getting them ready for the social part of school? Like before the year starts up, do you guys start mimic, mimicking classroom stuff or, or what do you guys do? 
Oh yeah. I've, I've worked with, uh, with students that have gone from middle school to high school, uh, and I've gone with them to the high school before school even started, uh, for them to able to, for them to be able to walk the hallways and meet some teachers one-on-one, uh, kind of lower the anxiety of going into a new school and, and having to navigate new hallways. Uh, but yeah, it, it's definitely a very crucial thing. And, uh, those final weeks of August are definitely a very busy time in the practice, just getting the students ready, making sure I, I'm very big on overall organization mm-hmm. and making sure they have their notebooks, they have their folders, they have their agenda. I'm very big on having my students have uh, an agenda and not using things like Schoology and Hack and things like that. Uh, <laughs> they still use it, but I'm very big on having them use uh, handwritten agendas. So I, I work very closely with them on on their backpacks and organization and having various colored notebooks and folders to kind of organize their work. That's awesome. So the, so, so the prep is huge. That is awesome. I love that. Yeah. I, yep. I unfortunately don't get to work with students before the school year. Uh, I know some of the classrooms allow students to come visit as many times as they want as the teacher can, can get there. But I also, I often think how cool would it be to open the school up for a class day or for like a, a week for the kids to just kind of, come in as they please and stay as long as they need to, to learn the building. Mm-hmm. Hey, we want to hear from you though. Head over to our website, speech science podcast.com. Tell us what you're doing to help get your students acclimated to the upcoming school years. Uh, you can email us speech science podcast at gmail.com or give us a phone call. 614-681-1798. You're listening to speech science. <laughs> Do you have an idea for a product or book? Or are you ready to go beyond in-service presentations? Well, how do you get started? And what if you don't have any business experience at all? Well, I have some great news for you. I'm Mailing Chan, and I'm getting the nitty-gritty stories from parents, teachers, therapists, advocates, and people with disabilities who have created successful businesses, and they're sharing their intimate stories with you. Listen to us on the Exceptional Leaders Podcast and fast-track creating and building and sharing your idea with the world so that you can help more people. Welcome back to Speech Science, episode 94. I'm Matt Hot, joined with Michael McLeod. What's up, buddy? Hey, man. I'm listening to a podcast right now, and it is the Dolly Parton story. Have you seen this? I have not. So I'm pulling it up real quick because I don't want to say the name of it wrong. It's called Dolly Parton's America uh, by WNYC Studios. Or I'm sorry, no, by Radio Lab and WNYC Studios. And oh my gosh, dude, only one episode in and it is amazing. Speaking of voices. What is it about? Dolly Parton. Um, so the first episode just talks about her sad song style. And this okay. broke over the news. Dolly Parton almost committed suicide at a young age. Really? Well, she said she was close. She never said how close she was, but she almost wrote a note. I did not know that. Ne- no one did. She just mentioned it casually in this interview. That's crazy. I love Dolly Parton. I should just say that, by the way. <laughs> All right. This <laughs> what you say? That. I, I could see that. I could definitely see that. Hey, so funny, true story. Dolly Parton is up from a part of Tennessee that my grandma and her family are from. So... In a weird way, it's like a weird, like, yeah, we're all family probably somehow. Okay. <laughs> the hills of Tennessee, Sevierville. Just outside the Smoky Mountains. All right, this next article, <laughs> this is coming out of the Language, Speech, and Hearing Services in Schools. The Journal 4, I should say. Uh, this is the effect of vocabulary and intervention on text comprehension. Who benefits? They looked at students in grade 6. They completed a five-session intervention based on robust uh, vocab instruction. Uh, Knowledge of the semantics of top words were measured pre and post. And then participants then read two match texts, one containing the top words and one not. The treated text and the top word list were counterbalanced across participants. And the difference between text comprehension scores and treated and untreated conditions were taken as a measure. And guess what? People that were pre-taught vocabulary did better on their texts exactly what a shocker so mike how do you teach pre-teach vocabulary this is something i put on a lot of ieps i don't put a lot of knowledge based or i don't put a lot of thought into it 
because if a student needs vocabulary, usually that's going to be pre-taught by the teacher, especially yes. for something in a classroom. But when you're teaching vocabulary uh, in the private setting, how do you handle that? Like, I have workbooks and worksheets. So obviously it's very different when you're in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Mm -hmm. So obviously in the clinic, it's just myself and the student. So what I'm kind of able to do is I'm able to take these vocabulary words, these single specific words, and help them find creative ways to tie it to something that engages them and motivates them. Like I have one specific student who absolutely loves the Avengers movies, loves Marvel, loves like very specific types of movies. So I'm able to find these uh, words and have them use them in a sentence that compares them to something that they absolutely love. And in the beginning, it was, you know, it, it took a little buy in from him. So it took a little bit of time. But now he's just coming up with these incredible sentences that are just absolutely beautiful. I, I, I wish I had an example right now. I wish I had the paper in front of me. But the sentences that he's coming up with, the, the example sentences, like he wrote like, uh, like uh, one sentence, like, do you know that scene where, where Thor sucks up his big hammer and Captain Marvel does not get scared? Yeah! He doesn't flinch and he says, I like this one. He wrote an awesome, awesome sentence about that scene. And it, it was great. He used the word correctly. He even changed like the morphological ending on it. Oh, that's uh, awesome. It, it was it was beautiful. So helping them find a way to tie it back to, to their life, their interest, their motivation uh, is only going to help in terms of working memory. See, I have a hard time with vocabulary, teaching vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a couple kids that do need vocabulary skills and I work on them. But like, I don't know where to start. So we just start, like what I'll do is I'll print out an article. I do have some vocabulary sheets and I'll print out an article and I have the kids highlight any words that they don't know. And then as a group, we try to decode and then come up with the right definition using any of the skills that we've learned and then try to like build a sentence with it. But vocabulary, I would say is I'm the weakest at teaching because when I look at vocab, I'm like, well, which one out of the hundred thousand vocabulary words would you like me to teach this week? Yes. So yes, I don't yes. know. I have such a yeah. hard time with that. Yeah. It, it really depends. I, I would say I really enjoy the vocabulary therapy. Uh, it, it's just different. It, it really depends on the student, mm -hmm. on the age, uh, really their, their overall engagement, uh, you know, with you within the therapy session. But when you're working with a student and you see that they're really grasping the concept of these words and they're using it appropriately, and if, and if you ever catch them using one of these words in informal conversation, uh, that's really a great feeling. That's true. Yeah, I love teaching vocab. You're right. It's a lot of fun because you're like, what was it? The other day, one of the kids didn't know the word addiction. Oh, okay. So then we just yeah. started talking about addiction, and then they wanted to know how does addiction start? And then one kid was like, well, can you be addicted to helping people? And we're like, well, not really, because addiction's kind of a negative. Like, And we had to talk about how some words have a negative connotation and some words have a positive. And it's a lot of fun because it feels like therapy's one minute away from going off the rails, I think, during vocab. But because yeah. <laughs> all it takes is one question and you're like, let's stop everything we're doing and address this thought process. But like the big thing I tried to tell teachers – when I'm looking at vocabulary is that mm -hmm. I'm not teaching them the content. I'm teaching them how to learn what a word means. So if we look at the word addiction, you know, teaching the kids like to try to figure out any words that they know that are in that word, or have they seen that word or heard that word before? And if kids mm -hmm. can like do those skills, I feel comfortable enough saying, Hey, now you can learn vocabulary with the teacher. Exactly, exactly. And, and it's really what, what is this vocabulary word? It's really, it, is it really for the purpose of helping them increase their overall MLU? Are you, are you mm -hmm. helping them to, to expand their utterances in social communication? Is it for an older kid that's more SAT prep style? Or is it more middle school age where you're adding to their vocabulary so they don't get lost in reading comprehension? You know, that, that that's one thing for us as SLPs to always kind of be aware yep. of uh, is really what is the purpose? Why are we teaching them the, this, these new vocabulary words and how is it going to benefit them outside of the sessions? 
Yeah, what is it? I used to have a phrase for this, and I don't remember exactly, but it's something like in speech therapy, we teach the skill, not necessarily mastery. Of, yeah, that's it. We teach the skill, not the subject. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it's we're teaching you the skill of learning new vocab. We're teaching you the skill of identifying main ideas. We're not teaching you how to identify the appropriate main character from the secondary character, but we're teaching you how to identify one of the two most important characters. Yes. But yes, that's just me. I don't know. Maybe I'm the weirdo. I like it. Yeah. Fair enough. How do you teach vocabulary? Head over to our website, speech science podcast.com. Email us speech science podcast at gmail.com or give us a phone call. 614-681-1798. Mike, this last article I'm excited for. It's the best toys for therapy. Okay. So this is coming out of uh, prweb.com. It's playonwords.com presents their fall 2019 uh, PAL Awards. It's the best toys, games, and media that spark language development through play. Play on Words LLC is led by speech language pathologist Sherry Artemenko. Uh, so what she says for early development, she likes Ba Ba Bubbles by Spin Master. Friends of a Feather by Ravensburger from Birth to First Words by Lynn Carson. Uh, for reading and writing, I'm just kind of talking about the top three. Uh, Blue Bee Pals Techie Rangers Book, Language Together Set 2, and Leap Builders ABC Smart House. And her language structure, she likes the Crayola Color Chemistry Lab, Eagle Chase by Simply Fun, and Matchorama. Um, and then she's got a couple of other ones on here as well. What's your favorite go-to therapy game or activity? Uh, so obviously early intervention uh, age. Mm -hmm. uh, you're never going to go wrong with any sort of pop the pirate, uh, pop the pig, uh, any game that has that, that cause and effect where you're engaging and there's that final thing you're shooting for. Mm -hmm. um, caribou is a big one. I'm sure you've I've heard of I've never caribou. played caribou. It's a big one. It, if you look it up now, you're gonna see that it's like a like a solid uh, like two hundred three hundred dollars yeah. on eBay. It's crazy, man. Look it up. What is it though? I've never played it. I've heard so much about this game. What it's is it? It's a fun it? game. It's a fun game. What is it? You have to you have to like kind of like uh, like you roll the balls into like a treasure chest. First, you have to pick a certain word so you can ask wh questions. It could be for vocabulary. It's real. It's really good for for early intervention age for uh, for MLU or many different things um but you pretty much roll the balls in until you get a certain amount it's hard to describe i haven't played it in a while. yeah it says the game can last about 10 to 15 minutes it's great for young attention spans uh the kids will learn matching letters numbers shapes colors and practice sharing and turn taking huh i've never 192 dollars on amazon mm-hmm I have never played this game. Crazy, right? But you like it? Yeah, it's good. The kids like it. That's kind of all that matters. Any other games or, or stuff that you really like? Um, trying to think. Shark Bite's a good one. You Ooh, heard of that one? Shark yeah. Bite's a good one. Uh, just overall games. Games or toys. Like I, So I work with middle school now, and mm -hmm. it doesn't matter, preschool, middle school, or high school, my number one therapy tool, game, or toy has to be Legos. Okay. Yeah. I throw Legos on the table. And I agree I'm, with that. It doesn't matter the kid with the selective mutism. They are, <clears throat> excuse me, indicating for what they want. My kids with AAC are going to the colors page. You know, I can get phrase expansion. I bought a like 300 random piece Lego set. And I will say that is my number one all time therapy thing. Really? Yeah. It's like, I get the most out of it. It also could be because I like it better than games. Yeah. I'm a terrible game person. Why? I, I don't use therapy. I don't use games in therapy. <laughs> like, like, I, I mean, I'm a terrible game therapist. Like, I I don't know where or why, but I'm big on, hey, let's just learn the skill. Let's talk about something. Let's play something. And when it comes to games, it's I don't I don't know. I think I'm bad at trying to turn 
a non-therapy game into therapy. I think that's my my problem. Yeah, that makes sense. So it really depends. It, also, you're kind of con, uh, constrained by the time. Mm -hmm, that's you know, true. So, so, so you have to kind of uh, like sometimes you just want to cut to the chase and kind of figure things out. But uh, but yeah. Yeah, I, I think maybe like the more I read about this caribou game, maybe I'll try to find it cheap and play it. You gotta find it cheap. Don't, don't spend that much money on something like that, man. Some, something that'll break. You'll you'll lose one of the balls. I am a master man. of the. Well, you know what? I take that back. I did buy some games at like the local, not Goodwill, but like the St. Vincent de Paul. Mm -hmm. I have uh, what is it? I have Pictionary. I have um, okay Jenga. What else do I got? What's the game where you roll the dice? Yahtzee. Yeah, I got Yahtzee. I can nice. turn those into therapy games, but it's like I, I watch people play like shoots and ladders or anything like that. And I'm like, how did you even know to turn that into a therapy game if your kid's not working on colors? Like, Also, Uno. I love Uno. Uh, I bought a waterproof Uno. Uno set the other day. Waterproof? Which, if you work... I didn't even know they had that. It's made for the pool, and they float. Okay. So the idea is that you can play Uno while in the pool. But if you have kids that have a tendency to put therapy pieces into their mouths or mm -hmm. you want to quickly spray it with a disinfectant these cards are just hard plastic they're wow. wonderful right okay yeah i didn't I, I had no idea that existed so all right That's amazing yeah i'll put if i find a link for that i'll put that up there also i'll link the 192 dollar uh caribou set i guess in the show notes i guess i don't know yeah go for it we want to hear from you. What games are you playing with your kids? SpeechScience.com or SpeechSciencePodcast.com or email SpeechSciencePodcast at gmail.com. Mike, the show is over. What are you doing next week or the rest of this week, I should say? Uh, the rest of this week, let's see. Kind of have a, a good amount going on. Uh, I'm definitely going to check out the new Star Wars trailer tomorrow. Yes. That's going to be exciting. I, and... I did, I just opened my phone to look at my calendar, and the first thing I saw was Star Wars trailer. The people that are listening to this, we are recording this on October 20th, and this yep. will probably drop on October 29th, right around Halloween. So happy Halloween, by the way. But, uh, yeah, so last week, Michael lit watched the Star Wars trailer. Yeah, yes, yes. So this Thursday, uh, the group that I work with, the nonprofit down in Annapolis, Maryland, the Focus Foundation, uh, they're having a big event here in Philly uh, called Oktoberfest. They have it every every Thursday, a really great fundraiser uh, for the foundation. Uh, so I'll be attending that. That's always a great event with a lot of families and a lot of professionals there. Uh, so, so yeah, that's what I'll be looking forward to. That is awesome for me. Yeah. I don't know if I got anything. I got Cub Scout stuff coming up. I've got some typical therapy weeks coming up and making up some therapy time because this week has been weird with lots of meetings. Um, I will say that what I am looking forward to is in about a month, I will be in Orlando and presenting on ethics and speech therapy and podcasting. So I'm excited for that, but that's about 30 days away. So, okay, nice. Yeah. Well, we want to hear from you because you are the most important person. That is right. You who are driving or listening to us, we love to hear from you. Head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com. Uh, you can email us, speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com. You can give us a phone call, 614-681-1798. Uh, if you are on Discord, I will have a link in the Facebook chats, also a link in this, and you can join the Discord, and then you can communicate with Michael, myself, or Michelle for free at any time you want. Mike, are you up at 2 in the morning? Uh, sometimes. So you might be able to talk to Mike at 2 in the morning. That's true. Uh, I get up at five. I check my discord right away for other places. I might as well check it uh, for here. And I will work on getting a better website uh, to link directly for that. Also, we want you to join us in Orlando. Head over to patreon.com slash speech science podcast. At a certain tier, I will take you out to dinner at Asha. Also, go to rate and review us. And in the immortal words of Janice Wright, always be a willow. Don't be an oak. The oak will crack under pressure and the willow will return to form. Nice. Our intro music tonight was Please Listen Carefully by Jazard's License Under an Attribution License and a Share Alike License. Our bump music was the County Fair Rock, copyrighted John Deku. Find all of his music at soundcloud.com slash dirt dog music. And our closing music is The Slow Burn by Kevin McLeod. It's licensed under 
Wow, I almost slurred there. It's licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license for the absent Michelle Wintering, the present Michael McLeod. I'm Matt Hot. Until next week, so long, everybody. So long. This has been an Exceptional Podcast Network production. Speech Science is edited and produced by MWH Production. Please follow Speech Science on Twitter at Speech Science PC and like our page on Facebook. For more original podcasts, please visit ExceptionalEd.com and rate and subscribe to our podcast anywhere you get your podcasts.